We listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Let us pray. Spirit of God, surround us with your presence that we might be filled anew with hope of faith. May the hopefulness of your promises give meaning to our gathering and our lives. Give us the assurance to travel into the mystery of your love, embraced as your children. Amen. Our reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Each of the four Gospels has its own distinctive flavour, and one of the features of Luke's Gospel is its focus on material things, possessions, money. Perhaps this means that Luke was writing for an audience who were well off. Last week, Luke told us a story about a person who amassed a fortune, a rather self-centred person, it seems, who then died before he could enjoy his wealth. And it raised the question of the attitude of a follower of Jesus should adopt, that the attitude a follower of Jesus should adopt towards wealth. This week's reading picks up on two of those themes from last week, what attitude to take towards possessions and the unpredictability of life. Thanks, Shannon. Pray. Grant, O oh Lord, that these human words may be the word of God for us this day according to your promise, through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The end is near. This phrase has become a cliché in popular culture and Christianity. On the one hand, it's the stuff of cartoons. You can imagine the sort of thing. Usually they involve a scruffy, bearded person in a tunic. Hmm, okay. Um with a sign carrying the words, the end is near. And then some humorous line, such as his wife looking at him and saying, oh, so shall I bother about dinner? On the other hand, the belief that the world will end soon has been taken seriously by many Christians throughout the ages. They sold their possessions, gone to remote locations, and even engaged in conflict because of their conviction that was God was about to wrap up the world. That strand of Christianity goes back to the earliest church. And it continues today. You find it, for example, in the Left Behind series of books and films. It leads Christians to focus not on the present for its own sake, but to anticipate another time and place, eternity and heaven, away from the present earth and out of time as we live it. Readings like the one we heard from the Gospel of Luke this morning can easily tie in with such an emphasis. On the surface, they seem to suggest that one should be more concerned that with the future, with eternity and heaven, than with the present time and place. However, that attitude has some bad consequences. And here's a couple of examples of those. If the end is near, then... That means that material things are not all that important. And that in turn means that the earth and all in it, plants and animals, mountains, rivers and so on, are of little or no value. And that can lead to environmental destruction, pollution and so on. And of course, on a practical level, this is foolish, um, since we don't know when the end is and we have to live somewhere between now and then. But on a spiritual level, this approach violates the biblical statements that God is creator and owner of the earth and that God cares for all creation. Here's another example. According to Jesus, we need to be alert, just as those slaves were alert. But if you push this too far, this instruction becomes a source of anxiety. I have a colleague in the US who as a child was taught that the end of the world was close and that at the end, all good people would go up to heaven and only the bad guys would be left on earth. So each day as Barbara came home from school, she wondered if her mother would be at home to greet her. What if mum is not at home? She worried her mother might have been taken up to heaven, but her, the daughter, left behind. 
And that's a big worry for an eight-year-old. Too much stress on the future produces anxiety. So these instructions from Jesus have unfortunate consequences and be quite damaging if we look at them from the point of view of the future. So what then should we do? One option is to ignore them completely, but that's not the only way. What if we shift our perspective? Maybe the passage is not so much about the future. Maybe it's about the present. Not so much about looking towards life in heaven and eternity, but life here and now. So let's explore this way of looking at the passage. What does our reading tell us if we decide that Jesus is actually speaking about life in the present, not some vague future? The reading starts off in the present. Do not be afraid, little flock, says Jesus. This is not a statement about the future, but about the present. Fear is something that a person feels, that we feel now, in the present. And fear is a powerful force. It drives the actions of many people. Fear of disease and illness, fear of failure, fear that people won't like you, fear that people will think you look ugly. You may recognize some of them for yourself or you may be able to add others. Such fears shape the lives of oh so many people. Jesus says, do not be afraid. And we respond, yeah, right. That's easy to say, but on its own, not very helpful. Why shouldn't I be afraid? Jesus continues, because it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that's another statement about the present. Give the kingdom, not at some point in the future, but now. Do not be afraid now, because you have the kingdom now. What is this kingdom? The kingdom present now does not consist of material things, but of relationships. Firstly, a relationship with God, a God who is not a distant superpower, but a person, a relationship like that of the loving, ideal parent. And more, relationships with others, all people who are bound together in their faith. Riches in the here and now consists not in material wealth but in the fullness of relationships with friends, with colleagues, even with strangers. This is the kingdom of God now. It is the community formed by God's love. Love of God towards people, love of people towards God and then flowing out to be love given to others and love received by others. And there's more. It's God's good pleasure to do this. God is pleased to give the kingdom now in the present. God does not do this grudgingly. You do not have to buy the relationship with God. You do not need a ticket to enter the community of divine love. Contrast this last statement with another view because there's a strand of Christianity that talks about God being angry with human beings because humans have sinned. And to restore us, to save us, this strand argues God's anger must be calmed, propitiated. God must be satisfied or bought off somehow. This, such people would say, is the function of the cross, the place where God's anger was stilled by the violent death of God's Son. Against this view stands our verse. It's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. No anger here, no wrath, no violence, rather joy and pleasure, and it's good. When God was creating the earth, as described in Genesis 1, God looked at the various parts of creation and saw that they were good. Now, according to Luke, God looks at the gift of the kingdom that is the relationships of God to humans and sees that, that, it, that it too is good. 
if the kingdom in the present consists of those relationships we have with God and others then those relationships are the treasure of heaven that the passage talks about the things we must focus on and the things we must delight in treasure does not consist in possessions but in relationships with others whether those are relationships where we serve or where we are served and that may be the reason that Jesus talked about giving alms using your possessions to help others notice by the way that he doesn't say sell all your possessions this instant the stress falls on giving alms on acts of sharing and assisting others it's not possessions that are the problem it's what you do with them keep them for yourselves or use them for the good of others recently a dear member of Scott's church died Margaret Flower her funerals tomorrow her life caught something of what Jesus was on about when her husband died she evaluated her life and decided to do good things so she paid for water wells in Cameroon then when funding wells became popular so her gifts were not needed there she moved on to other things a medical clinic for women and children in Sulawesi a school in Timor an AIDS clinic back in Africa and much much more not all at once but over many years she understood that treasure real treasure lies in our relationships with others those around us and those far away our treasure lies in relationships in the present let's look at that story that Jesus tells about the slaves waiting for their master it's not a story about an individual but about a group of people in the story Jesus says the slaves are watching for their master and waiting to open the door so imagine the scene what are the slaves doing are they all on the lookout for their master I can see them they're all over the house and on the roof like cockatoos in a tree they're all there at the window continually scanning the landscape to see if there's any trace of their master five ten a hundred of them and when the master arrives they all rush to the door and they all run into each other and fall over hmm that doesn't sound right sensible people wouldn't do it that way sensible people would work as a team they would allocate a roster of watches some would be at the door maybe dozing slightly waiting for the signal from the watches at that time that the light of the master has been seen some would be preparing a welcome some would have a break sleeping sensible slaves would work as a team a team hmm. we have relationships again without relationships without a team on our own then we're like the person trying to avoid being robbed but not being able to keep watch by himself Jesus said where your treasure is there your heart will be also what we value and possess shapes us so I wonder if we value looking good then do we become a shell with nothing inside if we if our treasure is in material things do we become isolated from people but if we value other people and our relationship with them do we become someone rich in love both love given and love received English is a funny language the personal pronoun you can be singular or plural your treasure your heart can refer to what I have as an individual or to what the collective group has you plural use y'all up to now I've talked only of the singular our passage invites us to think about what we as individuals treasure and how we each individually approach relationships but there's more what about the groups to which we belong what's their treasure
how will that shape their heart, their identity and desires? What's the treasure of Scots Church? What about Seymour College? What about Australia? What sort of the people will those treasures end up making us? Will we become a community of love or something else? Let me close with a quote from the Rabbi Hulel, who is about the same time as Luke. If you are not for yourself, who will you be? Oh, sorry, let me start again. If you are not for yourself, who will be? If you are only for yourself, what are you? And if not now, when? Amen.